All right, exciting day here in the W2 AEW lab. We have a big box here from Tektronix, and this is a new RF signal generator for the bench. So we'll do a quick little unboxing and show you some of the basic features of what this RF signal generator has to offer, and try to figure out how to make room on the bench over here uh, so we can use this in future videos. All right, let's cut this baby open here. Box inside the box here. And of course here we're going to have uh, well, the power cord, uh, the RF cable, end connector to end connector, and the frequency response to that cable. And we've got the packing list, the uh, user manual, and uh, installation safety instructions, and calibration documentation, and uh, user documentation on a CD. Okay, let's uh, lift this baby out of here. And so we get this box out of our way. Put that off to the side here for the moment. And let's see what we have for the signal generator. Put off the uh, styrofoam pieces and the plastic wrap. And there we go. This is a brand new Tektronix TSG uh, 4106A, a DC to 6 gigahertz RF signal generator. Uh, RF output here and then DC to about uh, 60 or 70 megahertz on the uh, BNC connector here and there's a whole myriad of connectors on the back. So let's take a closer look at uh, all the inputs and outputs and the user interface and uh, put this baby on the bench. A quick look at the front and rear panels. Uh, front panel is nice and clean. It's a uh, color display we'll look at in a moment. Uh, two connectors for the RF output. Uh, the LF output takes you from DC up to either 62 megahertz or about 90 megahertz depending on the model. For the 6 gigahertz model that goes up to 90 megahertz. And then the RF output takes you from about 950 kilohertz up to the maximum frequency range of the instrument which in this case is 6 gigahertz. So these are soft keys that will work with menus on the display. Your typical numeric keypad and quick entry keys for setting frequency amplitude and, uh, and getting to the modulation. A USB port uh, allows you to quickly load and save setups and waveforms. Let's take a look at the rear panel. Now, the rear panel has a lot of connections on here. Uh, IEEE 488 bus, RS-232 bus, as well as a LAN port. Uh, there are input and output here for the uh, reference time base. Uh, this unit has got an ovenized uh, reference, so it's a very, very stable reference. So you most likely use the, the output here to become the reference for other instruments in the lab. But you do have the ability of tying in an external reference if you've got that in your lab and you want to tie this to that. Uh, analog modulation in and out. And then this also features vector modulation. So the baseband quadrature I and Q inputs uh, can be put into here to quadrature modulate the output. 200 megahertz of bandwidth or so on each of the I and Q, which gives you about 400 megahertz of RF modulation bandwidth with that option. And then when you're using, uh, say, internal quadrature modulation, like a 16 QAM or something like that, uh, the I and Q that are used internally are also available on the back here to go into a scope or do further analysis. Uh, when sending uh, digitally modulated RF data or arbitrary modulated RF data using the IQ generator, uh, you can get a symbol clock and various event outputs that can be programmed to come out at certain times during uh, the waveform that you're playing out. So a lot of flexible IOs on the back panel. All right, so let's power it up and take a look at the, the interface and how you drive this instrument. Okay, pretty straightforward. Uh, you turn the RF output on or off with a simple push button here. Uh, you can set the frequency just by dialing in a particular frequency here. Set the amplitude. The amplitude can be adjusted from uh, plus 16.5 dBm all the way down to minus 110 dBm. So uh, a lot of uh, output adjustable range to test receivers and circuitry and things like that. A push and hold on the preset brings you back to just a kind of a preset condition. And setting up modulation is just as easy. I could either hit the modulation key here or the soft key down here to bring up uh, the modulation menus. The first button here allows you to select the modulation type whether it's an analog modulation such as AM, FM, or PM, or a pulse modulation. And you can simply use the arrow key to move over and then scroll down and select the one you like and move back. 
we select vector modulation that allows us to select you know ASK, FSK, QAM, etc. And there's a couple of standard presets. So uh, very simple to go and set uh, the various modulation parameters. Once you pick a particular modulation type, let's say we pick AM, the rest of the menus will change to allow you to adjust that. You can pick the baseband source, which could be an internal source, sine wave, ramp, triangle, square, noise, or an external source or a custom waveform that you load in. Once you look, uh, decide that, you can then select the rate, which would be essentially the baseband frequency. In this case, it would be a 50 kilohertz sine wave. And then for AM, modulation depth. If we select something like uh, FM, then we can see that that changes from depth to deviation, because that would make sense for uh, a frequency modulated signal. All the same other choices. If we go back to, we go to say, PM and select that, then we get phase deviation instead of frequency deviation. Now the optional vector modulation allows you to select uh, amplitude shift keying, frequency shift keying, and again the menus will change uh, depending on what you want to do. Let's say we picked FSK, then we can pick the constellation or the number of points. It defaults to a 4 FSK, but you can pick uh, binary frequency shift keying 4, 8, or 16 FSK, and again, pick the source, whether it's going to be a pseudo-random binary sequence or a data pattern or some custom pattern. And then you can select the filter type for the baseband signal, which will determine how quickly we're shifting from one of the frequency states to the next, which also affects the occupied bandwidth of the signal. And there's some more parameters on a second page to select the symbol rate of the digital data that is being used to modulate the data, or the, R the RF set the deviation, set the, the pseudorandom binary sequence length. Uh, those those uh, uh, menu items are basically pretty much the same for most of the vector modulation types. We pick, say, a, a, a QAM modulation, then we have a choice of you know, QPSK or 4QAM, 1632, 64, 256 QAM or a custom, and then the same choices for the baseband data source, the filter, uh, symbol rate and you know symbols and things like that. All right, let's uh, just set up a signal here at uh, let's say uh, oh 145 uh, megahertz carrier frequency, and I'll turn that RF output on. Let's set up the spectrum analyzer here, to a center frequency of 145 megahertz, maybe a span of uh, oh maybe 10 megahertz or so, and we could see our CW unmodulated signal here. Let's uh, play with some modulation. So let's go to modulation. Let's change the type of modulation to AM. We'll select that. Do a 50 kilohertz sine wave at 50% uh, modulation depth. Turn the modulation on. And we can see the sidebands come up here. Let's knock our span down to say 1 megahertz. Now we can actually see the modulation sidebands. There's our carrier. There's the upper and lower sideband for the, uh, the AM signal. Now we can see there is some harmonic distortion on the baseband signal, but it's a good uh, you know, about 40 dB down. So uh, that's, that's perfectly fine. Now with the uh, MDO here, we can actually look at the amplitude versus time variation of that RF signal. So if we go and select RF versus time traces, turn on the amplitude versus time trace, and we can actually see there's our sinusoidal amplitude variation that we set up uh, on the uh, signal generator. If we change our source to say a ramp, let's turn that on. Let's see the spectrum changed here and there's our modulation shape. Let's bring that back to say a sinusoid. Turn that back on again. Now uh, one of the outputs that was available on the front of the rear panel was the analog modulation out or the baseband output. I've got that tied into channel 2 on the uh, scope here, so if we turn that on there we can actually see uh, that's the actual baseband signal being generated by the signal generator that's being used to modulate the signal for this uh, AM modulation. Now, Of course if we change say the modulation depth from 50% uh, down to something like 10% we can see the amplitude variation has, dro has dropped down and our sidebands have dropped down as you would expect. Let's change the modulation type from AM to FM. And now with FM, we can see 
the modulation sidebands and it's normal to have sidebands spaced you know, at the uh, baseband frequency and the amplitude of each of those is going to be determined by a set of Bessel functions. I've got a video on that that I'll link down below if that's helpful. Now of course the amplitude is not changing over time so the amplitude versus time trace isn't going to show us anything. So if we turn that one off and turn on our frequency versus time trace then I'll just uh, adjust the position of that and the scale of that and we can see that basically has the same shape. Now for FM it's interesting to watch the sideband magnitudes as you change the modulation index. So in this case if we leave the uh, baseband frequency alone and change the deviation we can actually see you know, this, these sidebands coming up as I bring that up and the carrier actually falling. Okay, We can see our frequency deviation versus time is changing so I'll adjust the scale on that let's keep turning our deviation up and we can see I can actually the carrier actually can drop out and it's, it's actually a, a interesting way of measuring frequency deviation is by adjusting modulation index until the carrier gets nulled out it's a very accurate way of determining uh, modulation depth alright so let's play with uh, some of the vector modulations let's start off with say a uh, vector modulation let's pick uh, say an FSK and we'll do just a binary FSK, so it'll shift between two different frequencies. Uh, the source, we'll just use a PRBS, is fine. We'll leave the filter as a rectangular filter, so it's easy to see the uh, frequency snapping from one to the other. Uh, we'll set the symbol rate, let's go to say one mega symbol per second, so we'll change it a one megahertz rate at the max uh, based on that PRBS uh, data. And let's change the deviation to say two megahertz or so. Okay, so now we'll go from a single carrier here at uh, 1 gigahertz, turn the modulation on, and we can actually see the spectrum. If we go to our RF versus time traces, turn on uh, frequency deviation versus time, now we can literally see the frequency deviation versus time for that modulation. Now the vector modulation uses uh, the I and Q, or quadrature modulation. So we can actually turn on the I and Q signals. Now for an FSK, what will happen is we're going to have I and Q uh, kind of running at the deviation rate, or 2 megahertz, but the phase between them is what's going to determine whether the frequency is low or high. In fact, if we do a single shot capture, we can actually see this. Let's zoom in a little bit. Okay, and we can see that when the uh, frequency deviation is above the center frequency, we can see the phase relationship between I and Q uh, here and here that uh, you know this one which is I is leading Q and then we switch to low say like in this case here now the Q is leading the I so you can actually see the phase shift happening here and here where we're slipping uh, the phase back and forth between I and Q when we're modulating between you know a positive deviation and the negative deviation from center right, let's switch over to a uh, qualm type modulation so let's pick vector and let's pick uh, qualm modulation and we'll use a, a QPSK or a 4 qualm and uh, we'll still use a PRBS pattern we'll leave a rectangular filter so the phase changes are nice and snappy it's going to occupy a lot of bandwidth but that's okay let's set the symbol rate to uh, 1 mega symbol per second and uh, let's turn the modulation on Okay, now we can actually see it's unfiltered, so we're occupying a lot of bandwidth. If we change the filter, the bandwidth would change. We can see the I and Q data waveforms here. In fact, if we do a single capture, the I and the Q look like uh, NRZ data uh, uh, patterns, if you will. And there's four combinations, both low, both high, and then the combination of one or the other. And that corresponds to the four phases of QPSK. In fact, if we t go to our RF versus time traces, uh, let's go and turn on phase versus time, we can actually see the four different phase steps that the carrier is going through and how they correspond to the four conditions of the I and Q waveforms. Well, as you can see, this uh, RF signal generator it certainly has a lot of features and we've only uh, just touched on them here. So it's going to get a lot of use uh, down here and uh, it's the only problem that I can see uh, I can kind of summarize by paraphrasing a movie from 1975 uh, I think I'm going to need a bigger bench see you next time oh we're getting a visit from Sophie the lab dog